Welcome, welcome. I am so happy to see so many smiling faces today and a full room. Are you guys excited for some uh, Ulu education today? Yes, me too, me too. I'm an Ulu grower as well and a farmer. My name is Dash Kerr. I'm the executive director for Hawaii Institute of Pacific Agriculture or HIP Ag. I've been farming in this community for 14 years now and uh, we have a farm. We launched a nonprofit organization. Our core programs are youth education, farmer training, and we run the Kohala Food Hub, uh, raise money for that. And our awesome Food Hub director, Maya Parrish, is greeting today. She's a rock star. Yeah, let's get a round of applause for Maya Parrish, for sure. And yeah, it's such interesting times. And you know, some of you have been here before, so you've heard me share this, but it's like, this challenge of, of what do we do in the face of climate and these, these big uh, food security challenges we face. And that's really why uh, Maya and myself and our core team launched the Seed to Market uh, educational series was because we said, how can we mitigate climate, create food security for Kohala, and you know, try to really stimulate, stimulate and create a local economy. And we're envisioning 10,000 fruit bearing trees to get planted in Kohala. I hope you all can get behind that with us. Because of course, all those trees in the ground hopefully will mitigate some of our more challenging weather that we're facing, but also, you know, those trees are gonna need pruning and mulching and watering and care, and that's gonna create more jobs and opportunities, and that's gonna be more crops and foods we're harvesting. And, um, and what we've really found through our work with the Koala Food Hub and our efforts to create a space where we can aggregate, process, and distribute food uh, to farm to school is that what we're lacking right now is really supply. So the demand is currently outstripping supply still. So we need more growers, more active growers to get involved. And that's where you all come in. And that's where the trees that we brought came in. And that's where the amazing uh, Ulu Co-op comes in because they're such uh, pioneers, leaders, have developed such an incredible model that has led to a lot of trees in the ground statewide and a lot of local food um, going to, to folks. So how's that all sound to you? Yeah? All right. Nice, nice. <laughs> okay, cool. I think that's it for now. But um, without you know, further ado, I'd, I'd like to get a, a warm, warm welcome uh, for our guest speakers, Donna Shapiro, Shapiro and Kyle Jackson from the Ulu Co-op. Let's get a big round of applause. Aloha, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Oh, well, thank you so much for having us. We're so happy to be here. We love Kohala. Um, Kohala's played a really important part of the co-op's history and success to date. Um, and we're just thrilled to be here and share with you all what we know about Ulu and hopefully help inspire more trees in the ground. Um, my name is Donna Shapiro. I'm the general manager of the co-op. And Tom, Thomas. Next slide. <laughs> um, I'm here with Kyle Jackson. Kyle's our farmer member coordinator. He's been with the co-op for almost a year, and his role is really to interface directly with our members, um, provide technical support, visit the farms, um, and basically serve as that essential connection between the co-op and the farmers. Um, so Kyle, you'll, Kyle will be sharing some of the technical production stuff with you in just a little bit. Um, before we dive into that, just wanted to give you guys a quick intro to the co-op in case um, you're not familiar with us. So we are a farmer-owned cooperative business. Um, that means that our farmer suppliers are the owners of the co-op and they're the only shareholders with a vote. Um, it's a democratic governance structure. We were formed in 2016 with nine farmers two of which were from Kohala, still are, you know, important members of the co-op, and we've grown a lot over the past six years. We now have 121-ish, the number keeps changing, um, including HIP and uh, a few other folks in the room. Um, hi, Marion. Um, and we have, our farmers are spread out all over the Big Island. I think we have about 15 or 20 in Kohala right now. Um, we also have one member on Maui and one member on Oahu, so we are kind of statewide and growing in that direction. Um, go ahead. 
we just celebrated our six-year anniversary um, in July last month was our six-year mark. These are just some high-level metrics about what we've accomplished by working together through the co-op structure in that time. Go ahead. Um, and we are, you know, really at the heart of the co-op in addition to being farmer-owned and farmer-centric. We are a manufacturing business. And the reason for that is, as you know, if you're familiar with Ulu, Ulu has a very low shelf life. Um, it's also still relatively unfamiliar to most consumers in Hawaii State. There was, um, there was a study done by UH a couple years ago that actually looked at consumption behavior of ulu, and it found that the average resident of Hawaii eats ulu fewer than three times a year. So if we're going to get more food secure, more food sovereign, more resilient overall, we need to change that. We need to help people eat ulu as a regular part of their diet. Um, and as soon as you start moving in that direction, you find that supply is not great enough to even provide that. So it's a whole value chain kind of issue. Um, and, it's, and it's systemic. And so when the co-op started and we were aggregating fruit from our farmers, we really had to find a way to extend the shelf life and extend the season in order to be able to distribute it to people year round so that they could eat it um, year round. And so we've established two manufacturing facilities. Um, these photos are all from our headquarters in Kona. We have a facility, um, it's called the Honalo Marshalling Yard. It's owned by the State Department of Agriculture. We lease it um, and we've developed a whole manufacturing enterprise out of there. And that's really one of the core values that we offer our farmers, is that we're able to take on the whole value chain at the farm gate so that they can focus on farming. Um, and at the end of the presentation, we'll share with you some of what we've learned about processing and marketing ulu um, for those who are interested. Go ahead. Um, and this is just an overview of really the why and the how behind the co-op. Um, most people that hear about us and, and get to know us, they see what we do, they see the products on the shelves, um, but underlying that is a shared set of values and a shared vision and a shared mission and purpose that our farmers all hold together. And that's really what unites us. It's what um, grounds us in the work and keeps us going as a collective. Um, and so that's what you see up here. And I think the, the real center of it is the purpose statement, which is that we exist to restore Hawaii's food sovereignty. And for us, that word Hawaii, you know, food sovereignty, at the heart of it is really um, people's ability and um, empowerment to decide what their food system looks like and to not have to be beholden to, you know, 90% imports, which is the current state of things. And beyond that statistic, when you think about our staple foods, which are the, you know, main source of, of calories and carbohydrates that we all need to just survive, um, on that food group, Hawaii imports over 99% of its food. So we've, we've actually really improved in producing our own, you know, more of our own fruits, vegetables, fish, even other proteins. Um, but in the staple food group, the needle has not moved for decades. In fact, it's been going in the opposite direction. Um, Hawaii, you know, really subsists on rice, wheat, potatoes, all of these are things that Hawaii could help replace, uh, sorry, that ulu could help replace um, because ulu is so versatile, it grows so well here, it has such an important history and cultural significance here. So that's really at the heart of what we do and why. And I think with that, oh, I'll, I'll give you a, a little bit back of background now, um, just about the crop in Hawaii and then I'll turn it over to Kyle to talk about production stuff. Um, so if you're not familiar with ulu, it is one of the original canoe crops brought to Hawaii many generations ago by the first Hawaiians. Um, and in traditional Hawaii, you know, pre-contact and still today, um, all parts of the ulu tree were used. We think of ulu primarily as a food crop, but it was really um, an essential resource crop, and it is still a resource crop all throughout Polynesia. The wood was used for building canoes, um, the sap was used as caulking. Um, the leaves have medicinal qualities. The male flowers can be dried and used as mosquito punk. Um, it is such a resourceful plant. Um, 
Jeremiah was just telling me about an enzyme that exists really throughout the whole Artocarpus genus, which is the genus that Ulu is in, um, that is anti-inflammatory and um, uh, anti-carcinogenic. And, and it's, it's just really being, you know, sort of discovered, quote unquote, by science today. Um, but all parts of the plant were used traditionally in Hawaii. So it's an amazing plant. Go ahead. Um, and, you know, why Ulu? Why Ulu today? I've already talked um, a lot about this, so I won't belabor the point, but really the big one is Ulu is one of the only staple foods on earth that grows on a tree. So when we think about mitigating climate change and what we can do to um, make our society more sustainable and more resilient, it really comes down to trees. And when you have a complex carbohydrate that grows on a tree that naturally sequesters carbon, that is really you know, the pinnacle of what we can do to be more sustainable. So it really comes down to that. Um, beyond that, you know, it's a long-lived perennial tree. It can produce abundant amounts of fruit, um, and it's extremely nutritious. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, this is just a quick, you know, infographic. Um, Ulu has more beta carotene than carrots. It has way more dietary fiber than rice. Um, it's actually a great source of plant-based protein. Ulu has all the essential amino acids that our bodies need to digest protein, so it is a, a complete protein source. Um, and it has a moderate glycemic index, so for folks that are diabetic or pre-diabetic, it's also a great carbohydrate. Go ahead, Thomas. Um, and this is just, you know, more about the food sovereignty statistic. Um, we really feel that um, in the journey and in the, in the quest to make Hawaii more food secure, ulu is the most important crop for all the reasons that I listed um, previously. It certainly is not the only crop and we're very strong proponents of diversification, but we believe that ulu needs to be kind of a keystone central species in that movement. All right, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kyle to give you guys some um, info about the production side of growing ulu. I know there's a lot of questions about nutrient management um, and what sort of climates ulu grows best in. So Kyle will address all those questions. Sweet. Thanks, Donna. Thanks everybody for having us out here. It's really nice to gather in a different part of the Aina and uh, commune on these things that are really important to us and really happy to be here sharing with you about breadfruit. Um, so we've received a few of your questions through email and stuff before the event and we'll cover some of those in what I'm going to share but if you have anything else that comes up uh, in the Q&A after feel, feel free to let us know. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about cultivating ulu and some of the nutrient management needs uh, required for ulu in Hawaii. Um, Hawaii is a really awesome place to grow breadfruit. Um, the cultivation potential here is really amazing. Uh, you can see up on the screen some of the key factors for breadfruit growth, including the pH, um, temperature, rain, temperature range, and rainfall amount. Um, most areas in Hawaii Island between sea level and about 1,500 feet are pretty prime for breadfruit cultivation. Um, and as we're dealing with changes, we can go to the next slide. We can look at um, global breadfruit suitability distribution. And this is actually going to be increasing as a result of climate change factors in the coming years. So the amount of space globally that can be devoted to growing breadfruit is only going to increase. Um, and as Donna mentioned, you know, that is one of the things that makes ulu as a tree crop, which produces a staple food, really important. Um, because its, its habit, habitat range is only going to grow as we experience these changes in climate. Uh, talking a little bit about varieties. So here on Hawaii Island, we've got several different varieties of ulu. Um, we can go to the next slide to talk a little bit more about them. Uh, the most common varieties are the Hawaiian and Ma'afala here, um, but there are over 200 known varieties. And currently, uh, the co-op is uh, offering trees for sale of three different varieties, uh, Hawaiian, Maopo, and Otea. And we've got some trees for sale here today, and you can also find that information on our website if you're interested. Um, we've got some more info on our website, um, the video that is noted there, and that gives you a good description of the different um, growth patterns, harvesting requirements, and we actually go through and cut and cook each type of ulu and display that there. So that's a really cool thing to check out. 
yeah, talking a little bit more about um, planning and site design, uh, we discussed kind of some of the environmental conditions that are required for Ulu, but this is looking a little bit more at the different types of implementation that we can use when planning uh, to either start a new farm or incorporate Ulu into your property that already exists. Um, so a big question, especially here, um, is orchard or agroforestry, or a combination of both. Um, farmers in our co-op you know, are run the whole gamut of folks who are doing strictly orchard conventional style to people who are doing all multi-story cropping agroforestry systems um, based as naturally as they can. Um, spacing, the minimum spacing that we recommend for Ulu is about 25 feet. You can get away with more if you're doing agroforestry stuff, um, but that's the minimum that we recommend for the tree to mature and have enough room to fully fruit. Um, it's really nice to have irrigation if you're in an area like up here or certain areas in Kona. It's not as much of a worry in Hilo or other places, but if water is an issue, um, considering irrigation can significantly Im improve your tree health and your overall yield in the long term. Um, and another must have is ungulate, uh, ungulate protection and weed management. As we know in Hawaii, you know, pigs are one of our major pests for all crops. Um, and so making sure that especially for young trees, you have those trees protected. And that means, you know, if you don't have the ability to do fencing, um, doing some type of caging system, pallets, whatever you can do to, to give those trees a better chance to be protected from predators. Uh, yeah, we can go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, and talking a little bit more about agroforestry. Um, agroforestry is something that more and more folks are being turned on to as something that is effective, productive, and better for the aina, better for the community as a whole. Um, and there's a few different factors that define that that are listed up here, uh, such as alley cropping, uh, multi-story or forest cropping, riparian forest buffers, silvopasture, and windbreaks. And uh, we actually have an agroforestry guide that we've developed, and you can find that on our website, um, which is a detailed description of how you might be able to implement some ulu-based agroforestry practices on your land. And we, and we give uh, a couple examples of local farmers that are doing each of these practices. So maintenance, uh, a bunch of the questions that we received from folks uh, via email were about maintenance. And you know, for Ulu specifically, this is really important because there's not a lot of uh, research, there's not a lot of you know, published materials about how to manage these trees. Uh, so we'll talk about that for a little bit here. Um, Similar to banana, ulu has, has a similar nutrient requirement as banana. Um, we also have a lot of coffee growers in our network that um, you know, use a similar nutrient management style as they would for their coffee. Um, current recommendations are a 10 4 2 to 1 balanced fertilizer, um, but the closest you could get to that in an easy conventional one is uh, like a 10 5 20, or we also recommend an organic option, uh, which is a Bioflora 6 6 5 in combination with other amendments. Um, and the, the co op has resources and references for folks that are looking to uh, get recommendations for fertilizing their young trees. Uh, and we have nutrient management guides and stuff. Some of those are out on the table and a lot of that is on our website as well. We've got uh, digital guides, we've got videos, and we're constantly working on, on developing more resources for our farmers in this way. Yeah, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, disease management in Ulu. Um, there's three classes of Ulu disease, leaf, fruit, and stem rot. Um, we see different variations of them in different sections of the island. Um, most pathogens can be eradicated or controlled, but it's really important to be proactive about these things, as I'm sure you guys know. Um, one of the, I think we can go to the next slide. Uh, one of the main pests that we're concerned about with Ulu right now is the Queensland longhorn beetle. I'm not sure if you guys have experienced a lot of issue with that up here, but um, Ulu is one of the crops that is susceptible to this uh, pest, and so we're really keeping an eye on it in our growers uh, network and making sure that it gets report reported to the proper authorities when we find any. Um, another insect issue is soft scale insects and mealybugs that can be found on Ulu. And uh, another thing that folks deal with is, you know, large amounts of fruit flies and other things from dropped or aborted fruit. 
And I think I'm going to hand it back to Donna to talk a little bit about harvesting and some of the other processes that go into getting the ulu from the farm to our consumers and various partners. Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to talk about harvesting because it relates directly to processing or marketing. So go ahead to the next slide, Thomas. Okay, so um, the harvest, the harvesting season in Hawaii, um, we'll show you some graphs that actually show um, data over time next, but it is variable. You know, in some locations, they might see year-round fruit supply. In general, um, the biggest harvest is in the fall, pretty much across the islands, um, but there is variability by variety and microclimate. Um, the fruit is uh, currently picked by hand. Um, you know, there really isn't mechanized harvesting tools for ulu. Um, a bunch of our members have developed their own tools, and pictured up here is um, Stanley Eugenio, one of our members in Hamakua, who's developed a really awesome picker. He fabricates it himself. Um, his wife actually sews the sock or net. Um, and in general, what you want is some sort of a slicing apparatus. You can use. Um, like a, um, sorry, like a sickle. Even some people duct tape a sickle to the end of a painter's pole. Um, that can work great. If you have really nice grassy area underneath your tree, you can let the fruit fall. But if you are in Kona, where we have a farm and it's rocky, you want to avoid fruit hitting the ground because that can damage it. Um, so a lot of folks will sort of fasten um, like a basket or a bag. Um, in this photo, Stanley's holding a sock. So he's developed this sock out of nylon um, and the net around the picker is fishnet, so it's kind of locally available resources. And he actually holds one side of the sock, and as the fruit falls, he just like empties it into his basket or on the ground next to him. And that way he's avoiding um, a high impact on the fruit. The other thing that you want to avoid if you are using a sharp blade is slicing into the fruit. Um, and I'll show you some of our um, sort of fruit quality guidelines in one of the next slides. So go ahead, Thomas. Um, so when to harvest, this is, this is really important. Um, ulu can be eaten at all stages of its development. It's one of the things that makes this crop so versatile and so unique. Like what other fruit can you think of where you can eat it when it, the fruit is first emerging from the flower and then at every stage of its growth and then even after it's harvested and gets soft and sweet. Um, very few fruits, you know, um, and the fact that ulu's a carbohydrate at the same time, you know, makes it particularly um, unusual. So the fruit, when it emerges from the flower, takes about four months to mature, to fully mature, uh, maybe five months if you're looking for it to get totally ripe. Um, so that is a long time. You know, a lot of folks will see their trees covered with fruit and they're like, when can I pick it? When can I pick it? And they get a little bit um, eager, over eager sometimes, and they pick them young. Um, the fruit is totally edible, but it might not be prime for market. So please go to the next slide. Um, this is a screenshot from our harvesting guide. We update and publish a new harvesting guide every year. Our 22-23 um, harvesting guide just came out last month, and I think we have copies on the table and back. Um, so please pick up a copy if you're interested, but it's also available on our website. Um, and so when you are harvesting, it's very important to think about what is your end market, and at what maturity stage does that end market want the fruit? Um, the co-op is currently buying everything in blue and green. As an example, you may have other markets that want baby fruit or immature fruit, um, and that's fine as long as you know that that's how they want it. Um, the full-size immature fruit here has basically reached its full size, but it's not all the way kind of like brown and splotchy on the outside, which is an indicator of the, um, the, the starches fully developing. And then what happens as the fruit ripens, which we also accept, is that the starches start converting into sugars. Um, and you'll notice if you cut open um, a full-size immature ulu, it might be very sappy on the inside whereas a mature ulu will be a lot less sappy, but still have some sap if it's freshly harvested, whereas a ripe ulu, for comparison, will not have any sap. So those are good indicators if you are cutting into your fruit to kind of test maturity. Go ahead to the next slide, Thomas. Um, so this is a graph that was published by the Breadfruit Institute quite a while ago, I think probably about 10 years ago now. Um, and this is showing three different varieties in Hawaii and their um, kind of fruit supply. 
Um, so you can see that almost all varieties, except um, the Hawaiian ulu or ulu maoli variety, had some fruit all throughout the year. But they all really crest in the fall months. Um, go ahead to the next slide, Thomas. This is our internal co-op harvesting data of six years of you know, doing business with farmers in Hawaii. And our production data corresponds really well to the Breadfruit Institute's data. Our data doesn't split out varieties. This is all of our varieties aggregated. But basically, from July through December is when we see 95% of our fruit. And the peak season months are typically like October, November. And it definitely varies from year to year. In the last couple of years, you know, possibly due to climate change, we're not really sure, the season has gone later and later. That has had a negative impact on overall supply because in some of the um, higher elevation orchards, it's getting colder as the months go later and the fruit ends up dropping early. So fruit drop or fruit abortion, as it's called sometimes, is really common, especially with the Ma'afala variety. Um, ulu is the kind of plant where if it's under stress, it releases its fruit. Some plants, when they're under stress, they put out more fruit. Other plants release their fruit, and ulu is in the latter category. Go ahead, Thomas. Um, expected yield. So we get asked this question a lot. You know, how much can I expect my tree to give? Um, and the answer is, it's very variable, and it depends on you know, where the tree's located, the management practices. To some extent, the varieties, although all varieties certainly have potential to be very productive. Um, on average, we see uh, fully mature productive trees producing about 300 pounds per year. And that corresponds really well to this um, research paper from a few years back. Um, some trees can produce more. We have some farmers in the co-op. I think our, our top producing farmers get about 500 pounds per tree. Um, I've, I've seen written in different places that, you know, ulu can yield up to 1,000 pounds per tree. That's very unusual. It can definitely happen, but you shouldn't count on it. Right? If you're planting for either backyard production or commercial production, um, best to sort of anticipate something more conservative. So we like 300 pounds per tree as a rule of thumb. That uh, total volume does not come immediately. Um, we also see some misinformation out there about how long it takes fruit to start fruiting, or trees to start fruiting. Um, in the co-op, we, we currently aim for five years. Some trees can start fruiting sooner. Um, especially in lower elevations. So around sea level, if your tree is getting super good care, it could start to fruit in two or three years. Um, but that's not the average. So the average is more like five years, and then it will still take another few years for it to ramp all the way up to its maximum production. Um, and for reference, you know, in the co-op's current kind of prediction model, we um, say that 11 years is how long it will take for the tree to fully mature to get to its maximum productivity. So from five to 11 years, you're ramping up production. After 11 years, you should be basically maxing out, and then the tree can live for you know, 50 years, for decades, and provide fruit for, for generations. Go ahead, Thomas. So best harvesting practices. This is, again, a screenshot from our guide. And basically, it's illustrating um, what we think is kind of acceptable to the market and what's not acceptable. So the X's are the not acceptable. This includes deep lash lacerations or cuts, which can basically provide an entryway for pathogens to enter the flesh of the fruit. Um, diseased fruit, if it has a big phytophthora fungal lesion, <laughs> that's probably not great for most markets, but it might be fine for home consumption. Um, and then the stem. We ask our farmers to clip the stem. That makes the fruit much easier for handling if it's going into boxes or going on a store shelf or being processed. Um, we also have a grading system that we started establishing probably when the co-op was maybe two years old. Um, and this is our internal grading system. It does not apply outside of the co-op, but it could be a helpful reference, so I'll, I'll briefly explain it. Um, grade A fruit is at least five inches in diameter any direction. So some fruit is long, some fruit is wide, some fruit is round. Um, five inches in any direction is fine. And essentially smooth all the way around. So um, 
In the middle photo, um, you can see there's a fruit that has like a puka in it. That likely happened because the fruit was next to a branch and it's how it, it formed. It's one of the reasons why active pruning is important to remove the internal branches that can actually lead to misshapen fruit. Um, sometimes you'll see almost a hole in the fruit or a dimple and that can be caused by a nutrient deficiency. So all of those kind of misshapen, not smooth around things are we consider a uh, B-grade quality. And then the uh, full-size immature and the ripe fruit are also actually, that those are newly classified as B-grade. Um, in previous years, we didn't accept them because we didn't have a, a market for them or an end product for them, but now we do, so we, we B-grade them. So basically, fully mature, five-inch, smooth fruit, grade A. Go ahead, Thomas. Um, Post-harvest practices. Um, so again, this is, this is the co-op standards, but it's a really good rule of thumb in general if you're looking to market ULU. Um, so first of, first of all, there's sap throughout the entire plant. So when you cut off a mature fruit, it is going to leak sap, and the sap is really sticky. So post-harvest practice number one, let the sap drain. If you throw the fruit directly into a harvest bin, you're going to make it really sticky, um, and it'll be harder to get off. So what our farmers generally do is they just turn the fruit upside down for at least 10 or 15 minutes on the ground next to the tree, or if you have a designated tarp, you can put it on that. But let the sap drain. Um, the second one is soaking the fruit in water. It doesn't have to be ice water. It can just be kind of ambient temperature water. But what that does is it helps cool the internal temperature of the fruit because when the fruit's on the tree, it's absorbing all the sunshine and the internal temperature has field heat in it. So by submerging the fruit in water shortly after it's harvested, it's we found that it's the most efficient, kind of cheapest way to very quickly cool down the internal temperature of the fruit. And that will extend the shelf life significantly. Um, if your farm has little fire ants, and I believe Kohala is still fire ant free, is that right? Because you guys are amazing. No, okay. You have some fire ants. So this is relevant for you guys. So um, if you have little fire ants, the best thing, the easiest thing you can do that's also effective is add a little bit of dish soap into your post-harvest soak water. The dish soap is a surfactant and it forces the ants to release their hold on the fruit. With ulu, it's not um, as, I guess, prone to having fire ants, um, you know, kind of hiding in the crevices like coconut because it doesn't have as many crevices, but they still do like to hang out in the um, kind of that notch between the stem and the fruit itself. Um, if you are trying to ship your fruit in an island, um, you're gonna get rejected if you have any fire ants on your fruit. And in general, I think it's courteous to remove your fire ants if you have them before distributing the fruit. So this is really easy. Um, we have a guide about it online as well. Um, and then finally, you know, if you are um, sort of grading, grading before you deliver your fruit to market is always appreciated by the customer. Go ahead, Thomas. Um, so here's some more farm food safety type things when you're going to market. Um, delivering your fruit to market within 24 hours is a really good practice because Ulu you know, has a short shelf life. If you have refrigeration, you can hold the fruit for three to five days. Um, you really don't wanna hold it for more than a week if you're gonna sell it fresh. The ideal holding temperature for Ulu is about 50 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, Ulu is not exempt from the Food Safety Modernization Act, which is the, the food safety regulation um, that the, the USDA and the FDA released about a decade ago now, but it's been gradually coming online. Um, there are certain crops that are exempt, like sweet potato, I believe ginger, um, I might be wrong about ginger, sweet potato is. For the most part, it's crops that cannot be eaten raw are exempt, and ulu technically can be eaten raw when it's ripe. I know that there's been some effort locally to get ulu on the exempt list, but I don't believe that they've succeeded yet, so it's not exempt. 
The good thing when selling into the co-op or another processor with their own food safety plan is that that relieves the farmer from almost all of the food safety requirements under the USDA. So for our co-op members that are selling into the, the co-op, they do not have to follow the produce safety rule. The co-op has its own internal kind of food safety checklist that Kyle goes over with all of our farmers once a year. Um, and that's all you have to do. So that is a huge benefit for our growers. Um, otherwise, there's a lot of record keeping that you're supposed to do if you're selling. Um, I believe it's more than 25 or $50,000 a year in, in fruit sales. Um, and so part of this is that if you're selling fresh fruit, because it can be eaten raw, you are supposed to sanitize the outside of the fruit. You can use a light chlorine solution. Um, there's various certified organic solutions. We use something called, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the name right now. Um, but it's a certified organic solution that's activated by citric acid. So you basically mix it with citric acid and that works as a sanitizer as well. So there, there are different options for sanitizing. Go ahead, Thomas. Okay, so preparations and value added. Go ahead. Um, so, you know, as I said, we're a manufacturer. We have um, about a half dozen different Ulu products on the market. Um, and we've learned that the most important thing to do as a value-added processor um, and really the most important service you can give your end customer is to really know your maturity stage. Because from one maturity stage to another, Ulu is a different animal. Um, so all the photos on the, on the screen right now are ripe. Um, with ripe ulu, you can make desserts, you can make pancakes, you can make ice cream, you can make custard. It can be an egg substitute for vegan recipes. It's really versatile. Go ahead, Thomas. Um, here's some stuff you can make out of other maturity stages. So on, on your left is an ulu poi parfait. This is made with ripe ulu. The ulu was made into poi and it was fermented um, and it was turned into a parfait. This is at Kamehameha School's Kapalama campus. Um, fancy version of something they were serving for, lunch, uh, for breakfast. Um, and on your right, this is baby ulu. So when the ulu is a little spiky ball, um, it can be boiled or steamed and then marinated or pickled. It's very artichokey. It actually has a, a really striking kind of texture and taste resemblance to artichoke. It's delicious. Go ahead, Thomas. Um, and, you know, your end products can really be targeting a whole wide range of different markets. Um, commercial food service, the upper photos are all from restaurants using Ulu. Um, institutional kitchens, the bottom two photos were a collaboration we did with Kealakehe High School Culinary Arts Department where the students actually created institutional recipes for their cafeteria and the cafeteria tried it and the students rated it and it was really fun. You're looking at a sweet potato ulu salad on the far left and then an ulu chicken curry in the middle. Um, and finally, retail stores. You know, you can make um, end consumer products. These are, this is an example of our ulu hummus, and there's a handful of other ulu hummus manufacturers around the state. Folks make, you know, vegan pies, um, pancakes. I've seen chips. There's several chips manufacturers. So there's really a lot of opportunity in the value added space for ulu, and I think a lot of growing market demand. So if that's something you're interested in, we would love to see your products and eat them. Go ahead, Thomas. Um, and then this is just a snapshot of some of the co-op's products. Uh, again, to give you an example, so when we started the co-op in 2016 and we you know, had no facilities, we did a very, very simple, minimally processed product. It's on the upper left. It's still our most popular product. We call it... Um, Par cooked ulu quarters. <laughs> and basically, we go through that whole process of making the ulu ready to cook with, and then we freeze it. And we market that to food service, institutions, um, home buyers. Uh, we have a retail bag version of this, which you can find at KTA and Kohala Grown and Foodland. Um, and then from there, you know, you can get as elaborate as, as you're inspired to. We have an, an ulu chocolate mousse that's blended with coconut milk and dark chocolate and honey. 
Um, already talked about our Ulu hummus, and we've recently, I think our most uh, recent product line is a line of Ulu flower products. One of the questions from you folks was about how to make your own Ulu flower. We actually have an Ulu flower production guide on our website, eatbreadfruit.com. You can just type Ulu flower into the search bar and it'll pop up. It's this big illustrated poster of how you can make Ulu flower and some of the tips and tricks that we've learned. Go ahead, Thomas. Um, and then, you know, once you start processing and marketing ulu, why stop there? There's so many great crops in Hawaii. This is what we did when we started processing ulu and realized that it takes a heck of a lot of money and effort to build a commercial kitchen. Why not really maximize utilization? And so now we do recipe ready kalo, uala, palaai, which is pumpkin, um, along with our ulu. And we're constantly looking for other ways to really just maximize use and maximize value for our farmers. So if you just want to focus on farming and all of this processing and marketing isn't for you, go ahead, Thomas, you can join the co-op. <laughs> and this is really the big value that we offer our farmers. As I mentioned in the beginning, we take on everything after the farm gate. Um, oh, you can stay on the previous slide. Um, so this is just some of the benefits that the co-op offers and really the main one, the main two I would say are that we offer a guaranteed market for Ulu. We actually have an open door policy for Ulu and we have since we were formed. So if we don't have the market and you're a member, we will still accept your Ulu. No matter how much Ulu you want to sell us, we will accept it and then we figure out the market afterwards. And the reason we do that is because if we don't de-risk farming, you know, a relatively new commercial crop, then it's not going to take off. That's just too much risk for the farmer to assume on their own. Um, and so this policy is really what's allowed us to help build the market and increase supply over time. And the second big benefit is a fair and stable price. Um, we just did our first price increase this year. The co-op is governed by a seven-member board. The board is all farmers. They set the pay price. Um, so our price for Ulu this year is $1.25 per pound. When we were formed, it was $1 a dollar a pound, and we never went down. Um, so that's really, you know, a very important part of making sure that the farmer um, knows the price they're gonna get. And I've had enough experience with other industries to know that that is not always the case. You know, sometimes the price changes and you didn't know it before you delivered and that can be really disappointing. So um, in addition to that, I've already mentioned, you know, lots of technical support. Um, what I didn't talk about so much is kind of the shared ownership structure. Um, by joining the co-op, you um, actually are able to share in the profits of the co-op. So on a good year when we have profits to distribute, those go back to the farmers according to patronage, which is each farmer's relative contribution to the whole. So if you contribute 10% of the co-op's ulu, you're entitled to 10% of the profits at the end of the year. Um, and it is a democratic structure, one member, one vote. Um, and finally, it's, it's a community, and it's a community of like-minded individuals who all align around the foundational tenets, which I shared early on. Um, and so by joining the co-op, you're really joining a movement, a community of farmers um, working toward the same goal. And um, a really awesome thing, go ahead, Thomas. Um, for, for you guys in Kohala is that you have such a strong um, uh, set of anchor farmers in Kohala, um, including HIP, which spun off the Kohala Food Hub. And the Kohala Food Hub started aggregating ulu for the co-op last season. This year, we're gonna expand upon that partnership. Um, we really value what HIP and the Kohala Food Hub does. Um, and they're a really amazing partner for the co-op because, you know, Kohala is, I don't have to tell you guys, it's far away from Kona, it's far away from Hilo. Um, and so we actually have a drop-off spot here at the Wishing Well at the Kohala Food Hub's facility facility. Um, their intake station for Ulu, we just finalized it for the season, so it's online, um, or it's on the screen, sorry, so Tuesdays through Thursdays. Um, you can show up, but they would appreciate some advance notice, especially if you're coming on a Thursday, at least 24 hours advance notice. Um, and one of the big changes we've made from last year is that we are going to pay the Kohala farmers directly, and then 
you know, cover the Kohala Food Hub's aggregation service cost separately. So last year, um, I believe the Kohala Food Hub basically paid out the local farmers here and, and we paid them. And this year, we really want to standardize and even out the playing field and make sure that Kohala farmers have the same opportunity to join as members um, with all the ease that our farmers in Kona have. And we're trying to replicate that same standard system on Oahu and Maui. Um, so if you're interested in supplying the Kohala Food Hub or joining the co-op, you can get more information from Maya. Um, she also has um, membership applications, so really you can consider the Kohala Food Hub and HIP an extension of the co-op here in Kohala. So that's really awesome and we're really grateful for that partnership. And I think that is it. So we are happy to take questions if you guys have any. Oh, and if you have a question, please talk into the mic. All right, so does, does ulu ripen off the tree? Yes. Yeah, so ulu, ulu can ripen on or off the tree. When you harvest an ulu, you can expect it to ripen if you, like on your counter. If you harvest it immature, it will still ripen, it will still get soft, but it, the sugars don't fully develop. So if you're looking for that like really sweet, um, fruity um, flavor, you're gonna wanna harvest your ulu mature. Some varieties um, are more likely to ripen on the tree. There's a variety called momolenga that ripens green on the tree. So it's on the tree and it's green and you touch it and your finger goes right through. Um, that's kind of a variety specific thing. What varieties are best for the co-op? I have a ma'afalo which was purchased four years ago. Is there a good market for them? So yes, I would say the short answer is yes. Um, we. We love ma'afala in the co-op. A lot of our farmers have ma'afala. Um, ma'afala does have a bad rap, which I would like to speak to. Um, there, there are many varieties of ulu, as Kyle said. Um, you know, what the co-op, the co-op accepts all varieties. We really don't, um, you know, we don't reject any variety based on variety. Um, what we do prefer comes back to the manufacturing side. And what works best in our manufacturing facility is large, seedless, firm fruit. That goes through the peelers well, it has good yield. Um, the reason that some people don't like ma'afala is kind of twofold. One is that the fruit is smaller. It is a smaller variety fruit. Um, it's also a smaller variety tree, which is why some people love it. Um, it's dense and, and shorter, relatively. Um, but some ma'afala are beautiful and large and way above the grade A threshold. We see big variation um, across varieties, including for ma'afala based on microclimate and management practices. So, you know, our biggest producer, biggest fruit is ma'afala in Honau now. But we have another farmer in Popeye Co who has tiny ma'afala and is very disappointed. Um, I wouldn't blame the variety in and of itself. I think that, you know, we are a very diverse island and the fruit performs differently in different places. Um, the other thing about ma'afala, which I think is really important to remember, is ma'afala is by far the most prevalent variety. That is something the co-op had nothing to do with. It was one of the first varieties to succeed in tissue culture. The Breadfruit Institute promoted it for many good reasons, including the fact that it has a higher protein contact, con uh, content. It is more dense, so it's good for backyard production, and they were really promoting food security at the time. Um, so they did a huge distribution, 10,000 trees about 12 years ago, and as a result, ma'afala is the most prevalent variety. I think because of that, people see more good and more bad. Right? If something is more abundant, you're more likely to see prevalence of any trait. So I think that's a big part of it. But um, yeah, to answer your question, you know, Hawaiian ulu, um, otea, maopo, the varieties that we're currently distributing, those are our favorite, but we will take all your varieties, including maafala. What variety is best for higher elevations, preferably between 1,500 and 2,000 feet elevation? Mahalo. Thank you, Jeremiah. Um, so there is a statewide network of variety trials being um, managed by Noah Lincoln at UH. Um, and they have sites, again, throughout the archipelago, including in higher elevations. 
So far, it seems like Ma'afala does best in higher elevations. However, no varieties love higher elevations. So if you want to grow ulu commercially, best to stay below 1,500 feet elevation. Um, if you just really want one and you're higher, so far Ma'afala seems to perform best. Okay, you talked about ulu replacing things like potato. Speaking about French fries specifically, could you speak to a variety and the ripeness that would be most advantageous for making French fries? Um, so I think you're going to want mature, mature, uh, the mature maturity stage. Um, we avoid using the term ripeness just because we use the term ripe for when the fruit is soft and sweet. But when it's mature, then the starches are fully developed and it's firm enough to slice. That's the real challenge with um, ripe fruit for you know, savory applications. If you're trying to get a certain cut, it's really hard to get that neat cut because it's soft. Um, so that's the stage. And then on the variety side, I don't think I have a good answer for that. Um, I think you know, the varieties um, all are different and people have their favorites. Some people love ma'afala, other people don't. That's okay. <laughs> so yeah, I don't, I don't think there's one that's necessarily better for fries. The, the, so there's two that are kind of significantly less dense. One is ulufiti. Um, ulufiti has large seeds. So ulufiti is great for fries, but you do lose some yield, and it's also harder to get a standardized cut because of the holes. The other one is lipit. Lipit is a really neat variety out of Micronesia that's a hybrid between species. There's several of them that are similar. They're amazingly light. They're like fluffy almost, and they have holes, and they're seedless. So they're really nice, but they do kind of fall apart. So that's, that's the challenge, is if you're slicing a lipid, it has so many holes that it might also not hold up. Um, so, you know, probably just from like a functionality standpoint, you're going to want something dense and firm, like Hawaiian, um, Ulu Maoli, Otea, Ma'opo. Those are all like the seedless Western Polynesian varieties that are really dense. I have, a, I have a question. I was told that you can plant Ulu by the ocean. I was curious about the salt, the salt air. Can it handle? Like yeah, Ulu loves it by the ocean, uh, the by the salt. coast. You know, as long as you're not planting it <laughs> up against the shore where the salt water's on the roots or something, okay. you know, um, it totally loves the coastline. All right, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Aloha. Um, I was curious to know as to what your preferred method of propagation is between air layering, grafting, or um, by seed, and or what the differ like what the difference between bread nut is in relation to red fruit mm. mahalo yeah um so it, i think it really depends on what your ultimate purpose is um tissue culture provides the greatest number of uh keiki right um but air layering is also a really solid way to go you can also do adventitious shoot cuttings um, cakey that pop up out of the ground. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, you can take those and you can you can either make root cuttings of the actual um, roots of the tree and plant those, or you can air layer those cuttings that are coming up. Mm -hmm. um, and bread nut is the cousin or older brother to breadfruit. Ancestor. Ancestor. Yes. Thank mm. you for the right word there. Um, and maybe Donna could comment a little bit more on on what the differences are. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, Bread nut is the ancestor to breadfruit. Basically, breadfruit um, was um, selected by people as they traveled across the Pacific. Um, bread, the, you know, the, the ancestral roots of this family are in Papua New Guinea, is the 
the best guess so far. Mm. Um, and basically from Papua New Guinea, people brought um, the ancestor of breadfruit with them as they hopped from island to island across Polynesia. And as they went, they selected for the traits that they liked. Bread nut is really full of seeds hence the name, right? And the seeds are edible and a great source of protein and really delicious. Um, people selected for varieties that had fewer and fewer and fewer seeds mm. and um, propagated them vegetatively to make clones. So when you plant a seed, it's not true to the parent. When you plant a seed, you could be developing a brand new variety <laughs> which is pretty cool. Um, so we have um, a propagation facility at Honalo and our propagator, Eli Edney, is an amazing artocarpus nerd. <laughs> and he is doing all sorts of cross-pollination and he has seeds that he plants, then he crosses them. And he would love to create new breadfruit varieties. That's like what he's trying to do. Um, but basically, when you plant a seed, you're taking a really big chance. Mm -hmm. So if you want to develop, if you want to propagate a tree that you know what the variety is going to be, then you want to do it vegetatively. Um, so all the methods that Kyle mentioned are all vegetative propagation. Those are basically creating clones. Mm -hmm. yeah. cool. Mahalo. Thank you. I have kind of a funny question, but how do you guys feel about eating the skin of breadfruit? So it's, that's a personal preference. Um, we have, yeah, we have some products. Um, if you want to go to the product slide real quick, Thomas. Um, we have some products that specifically use skin and others that specifically don't. And you may be surprised to know that our Ulu chocolate mousse only uses skin. So that increases the fiber content and our machine is able to handle it, right? You'd never know that it had mousse uh, skin in there. Um, <clears throat> whereas the peeled par cooked quarters, right, our top selling product is definitely peeled and that's one of the reasons that people like it. So it's a total preference thing. Um, when I cook at home, it like depends on the dish, you know, depends what we're using it for. But you can think of it like a potato skin, maybe a little bit thicker, although that's very variety dependent. Um, some varieties have a much thinner skin than others. So we actually did nutrition analysis on the skin and the core. Um, and surprisingly, there wasn't a big difference. I think that the biggest difference was moisture content. It had more moisture in it. Um, there was not a huge difference um, aside from the fiber. Mm -hmm. I just want to throw something out there for everyone, and I'll share more information with you guys too. Um, it's an organic... Uh, soil amendment called C crop. C uh, is in the ocean, c crop.com. And it's a saltwater precipitate. Pretty much you can extract out the minerals, sand, salt content from ocean water. And you're also getting a bunch of biological uh, contents from the seawater as well. But the whole Artocarpus genus loves this stuff. They just go absolutely bananas for it. So look into it. Um, it's certified organic. And yeah, I'll share more information with you guys later. So c crop. Dot com. Check it out. Hi. <laughs> um, have you thought about diversifying into jackfruit? I have, I've worked with jackfruit, and I think there's a lot of similarities in that you can use so many different parts of it and same artocarpus family. So just wondering your thoughts on that for the co-op. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, we have done a little bit of piloting with jackfruit. We actually dehydrated the ripe fruit um, once, once in our facility. And I think the determination at the time was that it was too labor intensive. Um, in general, when we look at diversifying into other crops, there's two factors that we consider, well, really three. Um, are enough of our farmers growing it or interested in growing it to make it worth our time? Because we exist to serve the needs of our farmers. So if they're not interested in it, then it, we wouldn't pursue it. Um, but an example of that right now is cassava. We have a lot of interest in cassava, so we're exploring that. Um, the next consideration is, can our manufacturing facility handle it? Because we have really limited infrastructure right now. We're working on expanding, but right now it's super limited. So if it can be processed in the same way as another crop, then that's doable. If it's different, then it's more iffy, which jackfruit fell into. And then the third one is the market because we work really, really hard to develop the market for Ulu. We don't really want another crop that has no market. We would prefer to have kind of companion crops that are easier to market. Cassava doesn't have a market here. 
yet, but it's of such high interest for our farmers that we're kind of starting to take that chance with cassava. So those are the three things that we look at. Hi, do you have dwarf varieties of, of this um, ulu? So as far as I know, there is no true dwarf ulu. What some people refer to as a dwarf is ma'afala. Ma'afala is um, really different in its growth structure than other varieties. It's bushy, it's smaller, but if you don't prune it, it can still get very tall. Um, so as far as I know, that is kind of the quote-unquote dwarf. It is ma'afala. Um, and because there is an over kind of representation of ma'afala right now in Hawaii, <coughs> um, we're not actively distributing ma'afala, but we will propagate trees to order. So we have some farmers who specifically want ma'afala <coughs> because it fits into their farm design. Maybe they want a hedge or something like that and we'll propagate just for them. So if you're interested in ma'afala, you can let us know. You mentioned that it's very expensive to set up a food safety certified processing center. Can you talk about how large your center is and how much it costs to set up? Sure. Yeah, so we have um, our headquarters at Honalo, which you saw some pictures from. So that's a 5,200 square foot warehouse, and it didn't have um, a commercial kitchen when we got there. So we built a 400 square foot commercial kitchen from scratch. We basically walled in, you know, we took one wall and we built three more walls and a drop um, ceiling. Um, and that overall, I think the construction part of it cost us, um, it was less than $25,000. This was in 2017. Prices have definitely increased. Um, but that was just the construction that wasn't equipping it. Um, I think equipping it probably cost us another overall 25,000. Um, so 50,000 in total to get off the ground um, in 2017. Since then, you know, we've made a bunch of improvements and bought new stuff. What we're currently working on is expanding the kitchen to about 800 square feet, so basically doubling the size. Um, and yeah, we're in the middle of that process, so I can't speak to that cost, but it'll probably be significantly more than it was originally because um, construction prices have completely changed since 2017. Yeah, it's not a good time to do this kind of thing, I can tell you that much. But, you know, there are ways to do it cheaper. I think finding an existing building is definitely way cheaper than building something from scratch if you can. Yep. Uh, you mentioned that you can use it as a windbreak. Uh, so in order to use it as a windbreak, it has to withstand the wind. So I'm, I wanted to ask if you could speak to that. Do you want to try to feel totally. the um, Yeah, ulu is, is a really great and diverse windbreak, windbreak tree, in my opinion, because it can withstand the wind. Uh, you might have some branches that break off every once in a while, but it's it's really hardy tree, so it's not going to bother it. And in the meantime, you're getting the benefit of the food production as well. Um, so, you know, similar to using coconut or something, it's a really strong tree that can fill a pretty thick hedge or a pretty thick line along your windrow and then you also have the added benefit of being able to you know with really minimal maintenance in depending on your area be able to harvest a good amount of food too so my follow-up to that would be uh, at what point so i did see something that said you don't want to plant it until it's two to three feet right so at what point could you put it in the ground uh, and assume that it's going to withstand the okay. wind. So I, I need to add a, a caveat here. So while Ulu is really resilient, the wind will significantly set back production. So if you're planting, I think you're referring to the fact that we had windbreaks as one of the agroforestry techniques on the slide. So that was up there because it's one of the five USDA um, uh, agroforestry practices that we talk about in our guide. Um, including it in there didn't necessarily mean that ulu is your windbreak. It was more about incorporating windbreaks into your planting system. Um, if you use ulu as a windbreak, um, everything Kyle said is true in terms of it being a very resilient tree, but it's going to severely impact production. And what we see here in Kohala in particular for farmers that are in windy places without a good windbreak protecting their ulu trees, which I think is kind of more what we talk about in the agroforestry guide is making sure that you have a windbreak to protect your ulu trees in windy areas. Um, what we see is uh, stunting. So the trees are smaller, they don't grow as vigorously, 
Um, there's a lot of like leaf and branch damage, which doesn't necessarily hurt the tree's survival, but it does set back production. Yeah. But great windbreak species, um, I mean, you see a lot of them all around here um, in terms of some of the, um, the evergreens that people use. Um, Sugarcane can be a great windbreak. Um, some farmers up here are actually using like their guinea grass as a windbreak, so just not mowing in one, one side of the property. Um, Island Harvest, one of our members does that a lot. The only thing with doing that is that um, all of those cane grasses, the leftover cane grasses, they have a very vigorous root system. So you wanna make sure you have a good distance between that hedge and your tree because it can actually interfere with the ulu's root system. Hi, thanks for your presentation, by the way. It's been great. I'm curious, um, for people who are interested in turning, preserving some of their excess fruit for their own food security, what's the best preservation technique and how long of a shelf life can you get? Yeah, that is a, a fabulous question. We had our annual member meeting last weekend and we, our guest speakers were um, uh, a couple from Micronesia that were telling us about their traditional preservation method to make mar, where they actually bury the ulu in pits and then as they uncover it, you know, months later, six months later, they just wash off kind of the slime and then they, they cook with it at that point um, and they love it. Um, so if you don't want to do something like that, <laughs> there's basically, um, you know, two, two things you can do. You can freeze it or you can dry it. Um, freezing is nice in that it's very easy to use when you defrost it. Ulu freezes really well. So once you defrost it, it's just like it was fresh almost. Um, and it can last for years. But you have to have a freezer and you have to have a big enough freezer. So, you know, if you don't have that, then drying, obviously. Um, we have shelf life tested, I guess, our flower so far at 12 months. But just because we haven't had more time to continue the test. Um, I think the main thing with drying is making sure that it's all the way dry so that there isn't moisture in there which can lead to mold growing. Um, and then storing it in a cool, dry place if you're able, which is really hard here because it's so humid. Um, so if you have a dehumidifier, putting it in a room with a dehumidifier, you can also keep the, the flour or the dried ulu in a fridge or freezer, which tend to be drier. Um, when you dry it, um, we experimented with different cuts, like shredding versus slicing. Um, and we actually like slicing now. Um, it's a lot easier just to handle when you're moving it around. Shreds kind of get everywhere and they crumble more easily. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what we found works best for drying is we actually slice it and dry it. For freezing it, would you pre-cook it? Yes. Pre-cook it. Pre-cook it, yeah. Even if you're um, freezing ripe ulu, mm -hmm. which you could technically eat raw, we found that it holds up much better in the freezer if you pre-cook it. Um, and we've also found that steaming is the, the best pre-cook method over baking or boiling because it adds a little bit of moisture, but it doesn't waterlog the fruit. If you boil it and it really absorbs a lot of water, then that can change the texture when it's frozen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, does ulu affect anyone with allergies? Um, yes, it can. It's not hypoallergenic. There are some people with ulu allergies. Um, we aren't, you know, not sure exactly. I think you can be allergic to different parts of it. I think for some people it's the sap because there is some sap in the fruit. Um, we actually have a customer who's on our um, stock up on Staples monthly subscription, but he always has to skip the Ulu month and he subscribes for all the other crops. So it, is, it, is, it can be allergenic. I don't think it's too common, but it's not like Kahlo, you know, like Poi is really hypoallergenic. It's not like that. Good question. Hey, how's it going? Um, could you talk a little bit about your pruning strategies that you recommend? Totally. Yeah, that's uh, something we didn't cover today in the presentation, and I think we have some of those resources with us today uh, back on the table if you wanted to get a physical copy. Um, but pruning with ulu is actually pretty straightforward. Uh, it changes a little bit dependent on variety. Like Donna mentioned, uh, ma'afalas are a lot more short, a lot more compact. They have much more lateral growth within the canopy than Hawaiian or Otea. 
Um, but in general, your management strategies for pruning include making sure that you're topping the tree so that the fruit is staying within a harvestable range with the tools so that you don't have to climb or you're not, you know, um, putting too much effort into harvesting. And other than pruning those vertical leaders, which are all reaching up, um, pruning any of the water spouts or the small shoots that are coming off those lateral branches within the canopy, and then kind of pulling the canopy back um, to a level that is sustainable, you know, anywhere from eight to 10 feet so that um, those branches can develop more fruit in the future. Um, so overall, keeping the tree low, keeping the lateral leaders that are all shooting to the top, everything that's going vertical, keeping those trimmed down to a height between um, anywhere from 12 to 18 feet for a pruning. And you can take a really big tree, a really old tree, and prune it right back to just above the first couple nodes, and it'll come back. Um, it's called stumping. We lose really, really um, vigorous tree that can handle a lot of pruning. Anything to add? And, and we do have these resources online as well. Um, we've got videos, we've got um, physical guides, so you can check those things out too. Does anyone have any more questions before we proceed with the workshop? Okay. Awesome, thank you guys so much. We really appreciate you guys having us out here. Mahalo. So we got some cars in the house. You guys probably already know how to plant a tree, but you know, it's good to review, right? Yeah. yeah. And I, I'm sure we can uh, we can all share together. Like you guys have some techniques, maybe you could put forward something I forgot about today. But in general, we're just always trying to, you know, amend our holes. Some nice finished compost. You know, maybe some fish and bone meal if I have it. Or uh, we use like Nutri Rich or organic uh, chicken fertilizer some handfuls of that, some lime. Um, I'm just doing finished compost today because that's what I had. But you know, I, I guess probably the biggest mistake you see in Kohala is people will plant a tree, you know, in a grass area and they'll just be grass growing right up to the trunk. And I, I forget the exact data, but I, I think it was like trees are like 80% better when they have no grass around. Because again, those grasses have al allopathic chemicals they secrete, little chemical warfare in the ground. Um, so I always make sure to remove plenty of sod, um, get a nice, you know, amendments going, make that nice rich environment, and then plant our tree and get some good mulch going. And uh, so I kind of mix this uh, compost with the resident soil. Anybody want to join me so we can be like an assistant? Go. Hi, Jeremiah. Nice. Just looking pretty good. So great. Try to get like, I don't really like any like woody material in there, you know, just this carbon and all that. I mean, that looks pretty cool. It's, it's just gonna give We just got buckets, but I'm just gonna pre wet the hole a bit so it's not going in there super dry. Looks good. And uh, yeah, make sure there's no like grass rhizomes in the hole. That's another mistake I can see happening is like people backfill and they put the, the sod in and then all of a sudden you got those grasses again right around the base of the tree. This is a tissue culture. So oh, we got we got 40 tissue cultures from Ula Co-op. Oh, okay. And I'm pretty sure we what? I can't even remember if our farm team potted them up or not. Um, Looks good. Good level. I believe we got this tissue culture from April. April. 
Because was this the first batch of Otea that you got? So, yeah. And, like, we were really excited that they were releasing Otea tissue cultures because the majority of what we have on the land is Maafala. And we actually have one Otea tree that we really love. It's super dense fruit, really nice fruit. So then we just get all the soil back into the hole. Could do a nice little berm around it. Like bigger than, yeah, like it's a little small to put in the ground. You know, like in this situation, ideally we'd cage it. Like I really like a tree cage, especially in a dry and windy climate where I'm trying to get a tree established or if there's any ungulate pressure, like particularly, if your land's not fenced, you pretty much need to cage your trees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but how because do you hold the pigs them? are gonna come up and all that nice fertilizer and moisture, that's where they're gonna root. Mm -hmm. And then especially like, we wanna add chips around this, but, you know, if we add chips and we don't have fencing again, that's where the pigs are gonna be rooting. And then a lot of trees, right? They really like a little bit of shade and, and some wind protection. Um, in hindsight, thinking now, you know, I just got back from vacation, so <laughs> giving my head back in the game, <laughs> into the agroforestry movement. But uh, I really would have liked to, in this situation, plug uh, crotillaria seeds around this mm. and maybe some pigeon pea. Mm. And often we'll use crotillaria and pigeon pea as nurse species, That's nurse cute. crops. So if you could imagine, I can actually grow a tree cage of crotillaria around this tree. We do this a lot in our in our agroforestry systems. And then I would put the pigeon pea seeds on this side where I know the wind is. And like really quickly within a couple of months, this ulu is going to have shade and wind protection. And so that's a really great alternative to a tree cage, which, you know, obviously the t post costs money and the fencing and you know, the time to come together and the cloth and all of that. Um, and then also too, what could we add around the base for like a little ground cover? You know, we could either plug perennial peanut, or we could do sweet potato. So we'd have again, our nitrogen fixer, our ground cover. We do that a lot with our trees when they're just alone in the field. Like old reddish. Do you guys see a daikon? Yeah, with the, um, mm. the agroforest. Right around the tree? I mean, it's a part of a feather. Whoever keeps to an agroforest workshop, some of them will be ready to harvest and get it done. Share some of that. Nice, yeah. All right, only, uh, what was it, 999 trees, or no, 10,000, how many? Someone do the math. We got a lot more trees to plant, you know? But coming up on August 15th, you can help plant exactly. Monday, August 15th. So find me or Maya if you want to be part of planting some trees. We're doing it at Star Seed Ranch and Kohala Elementary School. So come plant some trees with us. We only have 900 more to go. <laughs> Does anybody have any like questions or input or other contributions to ways that we can improve uh, tree planting? And, and Star if you can grab, we're going to get one more bucket of water on this. Can I ask mm -hmm. you? Yeah, please. I'm noticing like this tree has some kind of bug bite. You suggest that a way. No, we what was the question? What was the question? Uh, bug bites on the citrus. Yeah, so I, I don't know, like, when it transport over. You gotta get uh, Brad, the citrus expert, back. He did the last, <laughs> last workshop. But, um, you know, it's like, it's challenging. Like, we have a lot of blights and pests we're dealing with. And, you know, a lot of times with the citrus, you can just spray off uh, the insects with a high pressure hose. Or we'll do, like, neem sprays, compost teas. But it kind of varies from crop, like, you know, the lychee gets, um, you know, the rust. You want to do, like, you can use sulfur from that, or, you know, it kind of, again, varies for, for different crops, but... You know, we haven't had any uh, pest issues with our ubu that I'm aware of yet at this point. I'm concerned about the queens, Queensland, longhorn beetle. You know, that's like, I don't know if, uh, this pile in here... Go back up. 
I was kind of curious, a question I had was if some of their growers in Hilo are seeing it. It started down at Puna and it'll be a matter of time before it comes up, but you know, like for our cacao trees, we use the tree cages actually protects them from the rose beetle. And it's a mechanical protection because the rose beetle hits the tree cage and the shade cloth and it doesn't, it doesn't fly around. So that's a way we can protect a young cacao seedling. Um, in general, a, you know, a cage tree is going to be better for establishment. That or the pigeon pea technique or the protolaria, some of those co-cropping strategies. Can you give us guidelines for how big, what is a tree cage? Why do they differ by the crop? How tall do they need to be in the material? Yeah, so usually a tree cage will be like about this big, about this, this ring, and uh, we'll make them out of hog wire, and then we'll put shade cloth on them. Maybe uh, just on the windward side will be the shade cloth, or we'll do shade cloth all the way around. And that might be, you know, there's all different types of shade cloth of that percentage of UV they let in, but, um, and that will be really good protection that will really help the tree. Metal stake. And then we'll do uh, TPO stake, or like for us, we got a lot of this thin diameter bamboo that we use on our farm. So we'll do bamboo. And uh, we will be, I think, our plan is to do some tree cages for the ones at the high school or the elementary because they're not pig proof yet. So we'll be doing an example of that uh, next weekend. Is there, as it grows, is there an ideal height that you start popping it? You know, um, we, so like at our farm out by Polo Valley, a lot of the trees were already kind of boosting. And um, like goals that try to get them all to about 15 feet. Just for ease of harvest, you know what I mean? So you wouldn't stop until it gets like 12 to 15 feet, it's it's really up to you. And I, I would say it's up to the tool you're using to harvest and to like prune. Like I'm trying to get all my trees where I can literally prune all my orchard trees with my pull saw, you know, or just like quick, easy climb versus like right now we have to actually climb up and tie in and all that. Does that help? Yeah, 12 feet. Any other uh, thoughts or questions or input about so how much would you water this manure? You know, um, like out near the east side or the lava during dry times, we would say a five gallon bucket of water per week will keep a tree alive like through dry season. So you could think like one deep watering a week could do it. But if you have portable water, which Koala Ranch doesn't have to, uh, you know, or depending on your water situation, you know, five to 10 gallons a week, I would say, should do it. Any other thoughts or questions? Raise your hand if you're gonna get a new loop tree and take one off. All right, go find Maya back there if you wanna buy a new loop tree. All this hard work, I'm ready for uh, lunch. Yeah, who's hungry?